this is, this is, this is. All right, let's do this, you guys. Episode 452. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Mike Herrera. Great to be here. Um, what are you guys doing? Are you cleaning? Are you driving? Are you doing some work? You have this on in the background. Are you paying attention? What, what's actually happening? Um, I pulled uh, I pulled a question off of Facebook, the Facebook message group or Facebook podcast group. It's the Mike Herrera podcast on Facebook. Um, if you're not on there, it's really a good place to be. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, of course, there's Twitter and there's Instagram. But uh, we're still doing it. We're still making this happen. But I pulled a question from Daniel Joss Leary. Am I saying that right? Joss, not Jos? Or is it Daniel Jos Leary? You tell me. You tell me. Why don't you call in? Because <laughs> I need to hear it. I need to hear it with my, with my ears, my ear holes. Um, so the question, I'll just read it off Facebook. It, uh, it goes like this. Mike, can you talk about this photo shoot from the July 1998 Rolling Stone? How did the opportunity to be in Rolling Stone come about? <clears throat> who was the photographer and who designed the ideas for these setups? I especially want to know more about the one with you and the girls. You definitely pull it off, but the girls in their underwear does not feel like a very MXPX idea. Laugh emoji. Uh, the skateboard one has never disappeared from the internet, but the picture of you with the girls and the one of Tom, I had to make these scans myself because I could not find them online. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, you know what's funny is I pulled that, I pulled I pulled that up, and I didn't actually, <laughs> I didn't really like. I, I read that it was like, okay, talk about the the Rolling Stone thing, but. I didn't read the full thing, and I didn't realize he wanted to know the photographer. And I don't really remember the photographer. You, uh, uh, is that something I can Google? Is that something you can Google? I don't know. Um, maybe somebody else knows. Maybe somebody has that magazine, and they could just take a look at the article and see what the who the photographer is. Because I personally don't have it on me like I, I'd have to like go to my parents house or something like that to find it um, <laughs> anyway uh, let's talk about it uh, rolling the rolling the infamous Rolling Stone photo shoot <clears throat> well you know we we were that was in 1998 so we had Buffalo coming out I think that was that was probably Buffalo if I if I can think about what, you know, so it's probably press leading up to the release of Buffalo and 1998, we were definitely, um, playing, uh, was it? Yeah. T we definitely played warp tour that year. Um, so I don't remember this, this must've been like, you know, a couple months before it actually came out, you know, when we shot the, shot the the shot the, the photos so this take took place down in um kind of long like long beach seal beach um seal beach actually sounds more right it was it was a beach that has those fire pits it was really nice but it wasn't necessarily long beach it was it might have been seal beach but m maybe people even recognize that skateboard that surfboards thing or whatever because I want to I want to say that was like a real backdrop that wasn't fake. So what we did was we went to this bar, this like sort of like I don't know what kind of bar it was. I don't really remember. Kind of like a California beach bar. And it was an all-day photo shoot. We we flew in uh down to LAX and got a got a car service down to I guess it would be like Seal Beach or somewhere in that area. Um just below LA, but not fully, not fully down into like Orange County, like Laguna Beach area, not not that far south. So, um, you know, we're talking California here. So we fly in. We it's beautiful. It's a beautiful day, and I don't remember the details of like how much we knew about this photo shoot before, but uh, I. I'm going to have to include some of these. <laughs> I'm going to have to include this photo uh, because you have to see it because it's just, it's, it's, 
it's so funny to see me as this uh, kind of just out of high school, early, well, 98, yeah, um, early 20s, and, you know, just still just in the thick of it. You know, we're in the thick of it. We haven't come up for air yet. We're at this, sh the, you know, we're doing lots of different photo shoots, but, you know, we do this photo shoot, and the idea is California surf skate bikini girls and we're kind of just like all right uh we were very uncomfortable like we were not i don't think we were expecting that to be honest i think i think we showed up and the photographer was like hey we uh we thought this would be cool you know and 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 we didn't know what to do with it, honestly. Like, we should have embraced it. And we did in some ways, but I think I had a girlfriend at the time. And, um, yeah, I definitely did. I think, I think it was Andrea. And um, it was hard to get through, especially since I didn't really feel like I, I – I didn't feel great about my body back then. Um, I wasn't super thin, not that you have, not that you should be super thin or anything, but w w I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I had let myself go a little bit, not 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 on purpose, but I just didn't realize like, back then we didn't work out, people didn't work out, you, there wasn't a thing that I did as a punk rocker, and we were eating tacos all the time and Taco Bell and drinking Mountain Dew, uh, at that at that point I think I smoked cigarettes and tobacco cigarettes, so I mean it was I wasn't the healthiest person, you know. And, um, you know, I don't think I look bad or anything at all, um, but definitely not like super like people nowadays usually look a little a little more in shape or something. But, um, you know, Tom, Yuri, both pretty skinny at that point, you know, <laughs> but uh, the girls, you know, they were just they were great. They were they were super nice. Like they, they weren't um, they were super professional and, and whatever we needed to do. They they looked like they were having a blast, and you know, we once we got over the, the the initial idea, we just went with it, you know, and we're like, you know what? What's the worst that could happen? You know, we don't like the pictures or something, you know. So I think the pictures are great. It looks like Tom is not enjoying himself, but he really was. <laughs> It looks like I'm not enjoying myself. I was, absolutely, um, but also, also probably a little, uh, a little self conscious, right? Like back then, you know, it's funny. In those days, we were so new. We were so new at, I don't know, everything. You know, we were still, we had been on the Warp tour a couple times, but like, we're talking like. We started the band in 1992, but we didn't tour until 1995. We played shows. We went to we went to Portland. We went to Seattle. We went to um, we went to Vancouver, BC. So we we went about three hours in in every direction, and we even went to California. We we did um, some some pretty big shows in California. Um, before we started touring, but 1995 was our first real tour, and so, like I said, we were new, so going back to those memories, um, it's definitely a blur, um, I wonder what the reality really was, because me, I remember myself being young, out of my element, we weren't used to doing fashion photo shoots, things like that, I wasn't used to being in a, you know, a, a wife beater, but, but of course, you know, it worked out, you know, <laughs> everybody loved it. Um, that skateboarding photo has been everywhere, still kind of is. Um, that was so much fun and very hard to do. It's just, I think the reason why that, that photo was so popular is because if, it was almost like a viral idea before that was a thing. Um, you know, doing something in your photo that wasn't just, you know, a band standing in, in there, you know. In a, in a line or whatever. So, you know, this this lifestyle, you know, California, skateboard, uh, surfboard, bikinis, um, 
was probably one of the main reasons and catalysts for why everyone, virtually everyone that didn't really, really know or pay attention, assumed that MXPX was from Southern California, Orange County, Los Angeles, somewhere. They didn't really know where, but somewhere down here, they're down here so much, they must be from down here. And there's the sound, you know, we were this like hard melodic band. And then we, as, as we progressed in our, in our songwriting and in our playing, I, we got more melodic, a little less hardcore. Um, so it really felt like that sort of like surf, sun, beach, bikinis, all that, you know, and I think that's that that really stemmed from that idea that Rolling Stone shoot and because because it was the first time people saw us in a lifestyle setting. Every other thing was like us on the street outside a venue, us, us playing, you know, us playing a show, you know, which is which is cool, you know, uh, but this is like us in a really out of context setting like you, you said it yourself, you know. Uh, you definitely pull it off, but the girls in their underwear does not feel like a very MXPX idea. Yeah, it wasn't our idea, you know, but, you know, it's funny. It's not like we didn't like girls. We do. We did. We still do. Uh, but it wasn't our idea. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, it, it's funny. Like, even when we see, you know, saw... Kid Rock come out with like his girls in bikinis later on. That was probably like 1990, I don't know, 98, around around then probably, honestly. But I don't think it was before then. I think it was maybe in the 2000s or something. But um, I could be wrong. I don't know. But I think Kid Rock's probably 2000. Um, he was on Warp Tour. And that didn't, you know, we, we don't. We don't really get in, influenced by that kind of thing. You know, I think we get influenced by when some band does a really great stage performance. Um, somebody, you know, can sing their ass off on stage live and, and really do it. Somebody can play really well, you know, like that, um, that impresses us as a band for sure, for sure. So back to the, the photo shoot, we do the photo shoot. Ah, yeah, I don't know who the f photographer was. It wasn't F, F Scott Key. Um, no, F Scott Key, F Scott Fitz, who did the um, b or before everything and after photo shoot. Um, but this would have been, like I said, I think this was just a press shoot, so it was Rolling Stone. We were on a press, kind of like beginning a press tour, I think, for Buffalo. Um, yeah, I think we had, we had done, like, that summer when this came out, we were on Warp Tour, and we were, that's when the, we had a street team and we had our, those, those, those antenna balls that had MXPX and the Pokemon at your punk on it, that antenna balls. We had that, we had, we had, uh, we gave all the bands uh, laundry bags for their laundry. And to this day, like, Smelly from No Effects still uses his. Uh, you know, and, and I'll see pictures of them now and again from band guys. So, uh, you know, it, it's 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 crazy. But anyway, so that was around that time, if I if I remember correctly. Um, and this would have been, you know, this photo shoot would have been, you know, a couple months before going into it. So the weather was nice. We're in California. Um, we do the thing. We we got to go to New York that night. So. We do our photo shoot all day, get it done, skateboard, woo! And then we, we head to, we get in the car and we head to the airport and we take a red eye all the way to New York. And we have, uh, m you know, press all the next day, um, you know, where you just go and you just go from one place after another, radio station. Um, you go to the syndicated, like, um, interview guy, like he'll interview you. And and then that's on a he'll he'll do it do a, a nice packaged interview, send that out to a bunch of syndicated radio stations like you do like a couple of those guys right do them and they're very very professional they're the types that go. They've got like all these, very very detailed questions based on something that they read in an article or, 
something that you did, you know, in your past on an album, and like you're just like, holy shit, these guys really know what they're talking about, like, because you don't always run into that. Usually DJs don't do that kind of research. To be honest, I don't even usually do that kind of research. You know, it's it's more conversational when I'm talking to people, but but for for the kind of things that they're doing, you know, they really want to get into those those nuggets, and because they're going out to so many stations, you gotta have something more. You gotta have something big. So. You know, it was that kind of press tour, um, just doing a bunch of stuff like that. And um, we flew all night, and, and and we were just, in those those days, you know, we, we just, they kept us working. They kept us working hard. And, and not that we don't work hard now, we do. We just, we're, we do our own, you know, make our own decisions on all of the stuff. So if you see something, you know, you know we... We had some some handed, and of course, there's partnerships that we still have a part of, and, and festivals we play. We don't make all those decisions, and and um, you do to play those big festivals. You do sacrifice some of uh, some of some of your your autonomy and sovereignty and, and all that. But I guess you still have your sovereignty. But you, uh, some of your autonomy, you definitely you definitely give up some of your your lone wolf mentality that we have. But um, we love it. So to wrap up, to wrap up uh, Rolling Stone, you know, we uh, I don't know why those pictures aren't online. Maybe they just didn't get ar archived. It was a long enough ago where it, where it wouldn't be archived. Obviously, it's archived now. But, um, you know, the, 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 that's what needs to happen. The, the, the web doesn't get built until, you know, digital images are made. Um, digital images like these scans or you know now it's going to be ai right but um but speaking of those festivals you know we're playing uh we're playing what, what do we have announced we're, we're playing furnace fest in september i think september 22 that's a friday night come on out to furnace fest in birmingham alabama a lot of great bands playing including one of my favorites 90 pound wuss from seattle so, I mean, they're not even from Seattle. They're from Port Angeles, really. But uh, <laughs> those dudes are so rad. And we toured with them so much back in the day. So, like, that's literally, like, my go-to hang. I'm going to hang with, with Jeff Suffering and, and the whole crew. So, anyway, uh, September 22 for that. And then uh, we're, we're playing When We Were Young Fest two nights. Man, I hope they just end up just... Throw a third night on there, a third day on there, not night, day, whatever. Uh, that's in October. Don't know the dates, but it's already sold out. So you find our find it on our website, mxpx.com. You can still get tickets to Furnace Fest, but don't wait because the price goes up as you get get closer, and uh, I think it will it will sell out. So yeah, that's it. It's a long it's a long way to go. So we will be talking about it a, a lot more as it gets closer, of course. Um, we don't want to wear you guys out too much, but uh, get the inside scoop right here, of course, on the podcast. Um, you're going to hear it from me. And if you don't, you can always ask. You can always call in and ask. If you want to call in, make sure you call the number 360-830-6660. And uh, subscribe, rate, review, all that would be awesome if you if you want to want to follow along. Um I promise I try to make these things worth your while. And I hope, even though I didn't remember the photographer's name, we may find that out in the future. It's a cliffhanger, you know? It's a cliffhanger. So uh, so I thought I'd do something new. I had a guy uh, email me. He, he wrote me on, on socials, and then I gave my, you know, so him email me. And he wanted to be on the podcast. So I'm going to do a thing called New Music Monday. New Music Monday. And... What we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to read you, I'm going to find his, uh, I'm going to read you his uh, message to me, and then we'll play his song, and, you know, we'll talk about it for a second. So anyway, here we go. New Music Monday. Hello, Mike. My name is Adam. I sent a message over on Instagram on your podcast page. So I play in Detroit, Michigan. Sorry. Let me start over. I play in a Detroit, Michigan pop punk band called Cascade Riot. We would love to have our new song, Welcome to the End, featured on your podcast. The song was released on 2-24-2023, so it's fresh, oh, LOL. So just last month, the end of last month, real quick. So um, 
Below, I have attached a link to all of our music and media, so, uh, social media, and I have also attached the song directly to this email. I appreciate you reaching back uh, to me on Insta Instagram and, of course, the consideration for your podcast. All right. You know what? You, we're going to do it. We are going to feature your song on the podcast. I haven't really done that. Maybe a few t random times, in, in, but uh, let's do it. Adam. Cascade Riot. What's the song called? Um, Welcome to the End. And thanks for sending the song in the email because I definitely wouldn't have taken the time to like go find it online. <laughs> Appreciate it. Here we go. Let's let's see how it is. song's five minutes we're not gonna listen to the whole thing but you know, that was that that's okay cool cascade riot you guys from from uh <coughs> excuse me michigan where in michigan again detroit of course detroit uh detroit michigan check it out the song's called welcome to the end <coughs> well done guys i know uh i know that you know you guys are probably without obviously looking at your past catalog you're just working on stuff and, and doing your thing. So uh, I wish you the best of luck. Um, good chorus. You know, I'd work a little bit on that verse. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not bad at all. It's uh, I just work on that verse maybe like because that's the first you know thing you hear out of your mouth is that verse. And so it should be a little stronger. But uh, that chorus really, I'd say is well done. The pre-chorus is decent because you got the bass line. So I like that. I like that it's very, very much in in line of of you know us Ramon style pop punkers. You know, um, good job guys. All right, let's get to some voicemails. Let's do this, and uh, uh, that's the first new music Monday. I'm not saying we're gonna do this every Monday because the podcasts come out every Monday, but um, now and again, yeah, we'll do a new music Monday. So I guess call in and uh tell me about your band but also email me um geez i'm just like giving myself more work aren't i do whatever you're gonna do but call in all right <laughs> let's get to it this is dan out all right so i had it muted here we go let's get to it Hey, Mike, this is Dan out in Bakersfield, California, longtime fan, first-time caller. Just wanted to call, and, you know, man, I've been to so many shows, but the first show I ever saw you guys at was 1996 at the Gate in Bakersfield. It was just after Life in General came out, and the place was bonkers. I was the guy wearing the MXPX shirt back when that wasn't the thing to do. You, you can't wear the band shirt to the band show, right? But I did anyway. I didn't care. Anyway, fast forward to the last time that I saw you guys was in Ventura with Five Iron Frenzy and Dogwood for Dogwood's reunion show. Okay. And uh, I actually played two years in Dogwood forever ago. But anyway, so I was backstage with them, and uh, I had this moment where I'm looking around the room, and I see all the MXPX guys. I see the Five Iron Frenzy guys. I see Dogwood, you know, which they hadn't been together in years, you know, and and I'm like, what the heck is going on right now? Like, where am I at? Anyway, I had a question if you have ever had that kind of a reaction to being somewhere in your career at some point, being like, what the heck is going on right now as I'm standing here looking at something magical happen? 
you know, I, I think I think back like maybe that was Dave Grohl in the studio doing the one two three go for next big thing or something like that. I, you know, th- those random things that happen that you're like, I can't even believe this is happening right now. Anyway, I just wanted to know maybe a couple of times when that's happened to you in your uh, in your life in uh, in the life of MXPX. That'd be cool to find out. Thanks, Mike. Love you, buddy. Talk to you soon. Dan, what's up, dude? That's that's a great story. That's awesome. Um, thanks for calling in. The gate. I don't even think I remember visually what that is. That place. You know, there's been so many, so many venues over the years. Um, certainly, I remember Ventura Theater. Great spot. Great show. I remember the show. Um, we have some photos of that show. That was before we were like filming. You know, we, we've gone up and down trying to film certain shows, but we don't have any video footage of that show that I know of. Bummer. But um, great show, and that was a great string of shows that we had done. I think we did San Diego that that run as well. Yeah, with Dogwood, of course we would have. Um, Josh, Josh uh, is the singer. He's gonna he's gonna come back on the podcast at some point. So we we always like to talk hot sauce. Mexican food, any kind of food, but Mexican food, we love it. And um, music, of course. So we'll get him back on. Um, Josh Kimball. Anyway, um, let's let's get to the next one. Thanks for calling in. Oh, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I didn't answer your question. I just talked about the venues. Um, let me answer the question. Um, yeah, I've had some moments like that. Uh, you know, definitely what you mentioned, um, Dave Grohl, hanging out with, Dave Grohl, doing beer bongs with Dave Grohl, playing foo, foosball with the Foo Fighters. Um, how ironic is that? I don't know if that's ironic, actually. It's coincidental. No, but um, yeah, that was great. Um, having having um, Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick come into the studio while we're, we're recording Misplaced Memories and the bridge is... Dun, 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 dun. Seems like yesterday. I was cruising down Chico Way. Chin, 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 chin. Rick Nielsen comes in. He's bobbing his head. He's like, "Sounds like a weird version of Southern Girls." Yeah. So he was kind of like saying that the song reminded him of one of their hit songs, Southern Girls. And the, what reminded him is that bounciness, that junk, 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 yeah. And and that was like, no way did he just pop in here and say that. That's amazing. Um, and uh, at the time, Roger Manning was was playing keyboards. He played keyboards on that record, um, and he was wearing a cheap trick shirt. You know, the the repeater cheap trick shirt. So. It's like whoa. So one of those moments, yes, that was, uh, and that was the ever passing moment. Same, same session. That whole out, that whole recording session was us living a, a rock star's dream. You know, we were going out to Hollywood, out to clubs with, you know, and uh, I don't want to get into it what all we were into, but um, yeah. So let's. So another one I would say would be uh, backstage. Um, at Pukel Pop Fest, I think it was Pukel Pop Fest in Belgium, and a bunch of bands we knew were back there, of course, but Metallica was back there because they were headlining, and I just remember like just walking through the backstage, and it's the backstage is like this outdoor courtyard, almost like a, a mini mall kind of thing with in the, instead of stores, storefronts, it would be dressing rooms so you have a dressing room area dressing room dressing room and then like in the back there might be like a row of like toilets and then like some showers and and, and stuff in the back areas and then like on the other side you have a walkway through there's a whole nother row where it's open in the in the in the center like very open like there's places to sit places to lounge places to set your things if you need to but then each side is is these small buildings of dressing rooms so each band has a dressing room and metallica probably has like five dressing rooms or you know hold all their people and lars probably has a drum set set up in one of those places or whatever but just seeing james hetfield just like hanging out outside in the promenade in the open area as i'm walking by I just be like 
you know, I didn't, I didn't talk to him or anything, didn't come up to him, you know, because he was, one, looked busy, and, and one, you just kind of want to, like, be like, I'm, I'm here, too, like, I'm, I'm supposed to be here, and, I, you know what I mean, like, not like some fanboy coming up to, you know, so, like, I always kind of played it cool like that, but uh, definitely, you know, fanboy on the inside a little bit, like, going, like, that's James Hetfield, and then later on that night, we got to just be side stage watching them play. Nowadays, most big bands like that won't let anybody except for their initial guests and crew up on that side of the stage. I'm talking like any bigger bands like that. So that was really cool. Um, opening for Joe Strummer was one of those surreal, surreal moments. Like a, a moment where <clears throat> we were just like, this is something we're going to talk about for the rest of our lives. I guess you could say also opening for the Sex Pistols, but it wasn't in the same way because uh, we got to kind of like see Joe right face to face, but we didn't meet any of the Sex Pistols guys face to face. We got kicked out of the, the backstage area before they showed up. They wouldn't arrive unless we, and, and Goldfinger as well. Goldfinger was the main support that night and uh, for them, and we were the openers. But um, yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, insane. Th th how the tables have turned. <laughs> now Gold Goldfinger opening for us. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, that was an amazing moment when we, when we got to open for, for both Goldfinger and Sex Pistols. But, you know, the Sex Pistols was the one. Um, there's m other moments like that for sure. I could keep going. But that, that's a great question. Um, let's move on. And Dan, that's crazy. You used to play in Dogwood. Very cool, very cool. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's see what we got. I gotta find find the next one. Here we go. Hey, Mike. This is Herbie Noble here, longtime fan. I just wanted to ask, uh, maybe you could tell me what kind of pedal and amp Tom was using for life in general, because that's a really killer tone. And then I was also wondering if you can give a little background on the song Unopposed. Thank you. Thank you, MSTX, for all the great music. All right, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's an easy one. Um, is the first one, anyway. Um, so we recorded Life in General down in Hollywood, California, with Steve Kravak, and it was at West Beach Recorders. And that was Epitaph's main studio. That's where they did most of their, their records. And, you know, Mr. Brett owned the place. And and uh, Steve was basically like that in-house engineer at that point. Or had been. And they had, had kind of recently kind of started doing just more of his own records. But anyway, we, we went down there and we recorded it um, with a Marshall. So uh, Tom recorded it with... Uh, a Les Paul standard guitar, same guitar for both sides. We did a left and a right track and both sides because Steve was very wary about having, he had had some, re he had recorded some records in the past where they had to re-record the whole record again, be not the whole record, but all the guitars because one guitar was out of tune and they recorded everything to that guitar and then everything was out of tune. So he's like, we just got to use one guitar, just keep tuning it really get this he was like a little like a, a tuning nazi but uh it paid off i mean the record sounds great but so les paul standard both sides into side one marshall jmp now that's a classic old school sounding amp i don't know what the year was probably somewhere in the 70s and then side two into a mesa boogie dual rectifier another classic new school sounding amp you can get so much crunch out of it and um, that really that really added a lot of grit to the other side. And then on both sides was the same Marshall 412 cabinet. And uh, my you didn't ask, but uh, my bass was probably just uh, was uh, you know Ernie was sorry my my bass was not Ernie Ball. This was before I was er Ernie was uh, endorsed by Ernie Ball. So I think the bass I used was my uh fender p bass i have a vintage fender p bass that i that i got when when did i get that 
actually, I don't think that, no, 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 no. No, I used, I did use, I'm trying to remember, did I use, an, I might have used an Ernie Ball Stingray. Um, I'm having a real hard time remembering, um, but it was before I was endorsed by them. Um, so, but for the bass amp, I use an SVT cab, you know, and then I used a Ampeg SVT cab, and then I used a 1970s vintage SVT classic head. I went out, I bought it out of the recycler. Um, it's like a newspaper that has like all the ads in it. It was like the Craig, it was Craigslist before Craigslist, right? And the one in Hollywood had so much good gear all over it. And so I found, I found multiple things. I, found, I bought a, I bought a guitar cab for Tom out of there once. Uh, yeah, a couple of different things. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's get on to your next question. Unopposed. Unopposed is a song off of, off of, uh, what? Um, let me just look it up. Um, unopposed. Poconature, right? Let me just look it up. Yeah. I found it. All right, yeah, it's so, it's track six. I just have to remember. I'm playing this so I can remember what it is, what song it is. It's been so long. All right, all right, all right. Um, let's see. <laughs> You know, uh, this is like, this song, Unopposed, it's, it's a, a struggle song. It's like, I think, honestly, I was listening to a lot of Bad Religion, and like, that was my influence. That was my inspiration. Yeah, yeah just, you know, hardcore stuff. Now, what you hear there is not what I wrote, <laughs> but Andy couldn't play the part. So he kind of got close to it. I'm like, you know, that sounds pretty cool, actually. So let's do that. You know, that little it's like that thing. You couldn't even try to play that. Like, it's like not actually a part. It's a it's him trying to play the part, but we just didn't have the skills. And we we're literally playing this almost live. Yeah. Yeah, this this you know this kind of stuff is just us just experimenting, trying different things out, um, not realizing that you know after a while people are going to be very confused when you keep changing the the whole song. But but at the same time, it works, right? So now you know repeat sec you know repeat the the verse again, same same lyrics. I probably should have written more lyrics, but I didn't. We just doubled it and called it a day. So this is just, uh, yeah, I don't know what the, this is. I was probably writing this about something in particular at the time, but to be honest, I don't remember. It's not like there was some, like, big struggle in my life, you know. Like, I had the same struggles we all had, you know. Um, back then, life was much more simple. Just kind of crazy, but... So that's that's unopposed off of poking at you now every now and again like when we were doing the live streams we would do like an old song off of off of poking at you or off of you know teenage politics it's just like oh my gosh what were we what were we thinking with some of these parts you know like yuri has to sometimes like rewrite the part because it's like kind of messed it's like i did i actually played the part wrong like you know it wasn't it, you know, it passed, but it probably shouldn't have, you know, like we just didn't know to like redo it at the time. Like the same, same thing I was talking about last or, or two weeks ago when I was talking about Arthur in the EP and has recording that stuff and, and not using auto tune and, and not knowing the, the, not realizing we should probably go back and like record a bunch of takes. So we have like a bunch of takes to take from, like, I didn't know about 
comping vocals back then. Like, like all these techniques that we have now just weren't a thing back then. It was, you're either good or you're just sloppy. And we were just, we were kind of good, but we were sloppy, you know? So I was like, I guess we're okay with, I'm okay with being sloppy as long as there's some meat to it, as long as some energy to it, you know? As long as it sounds cool. Like that that guitar part. I can dig that. All right, let's get to the next one. Unopposed. Thanks for calling in, Herbie. Very cool. Mike, what's up? It's Suge in Fort Worth. Um, dude, I don't know. Maybe you have. I was thinking about Warp Tour stuff. Do you have a favorite Warp Tour memory, maybe, or some Warp Tour shenanigans that we should know about? Um, I think that'd be really cool to know about. I know we all grew up on all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, if you got anything like that, some fucking Warp Tour shenanigans, yeah, lo- let us know, bro. Uh, appreciate you, man. Uh, thank you. Bye. Shug. Shug. Sugar ring ding ding. Rob Schneider right there for you. <laughs> Sugarino. Mm. Warp tour shenanigans. Shug shenanigans. Maybe you should start your own podcast called Shug's Shenanigans. Don't do that. That's probably a bad idea. But uh, <laughs> uh all right. What do I got? What do I got for you? Um We've done a lot of different things on Warp Tour, for sure. Which time? Which time? You know, um, one year, we met Oliver Peck, and he's a tattoo artist from from Dallas, Dallas, Texas. And he was writing with, I just threw my pen across the room. I literally <laughs> threw my pen across the room. He was, he was writing, writing, not writing, but writing with, Matchbook Romance, those guys, and they were, they they only had room for him for like a week. He wanted to stay longer, and so they're like, hey, come ride with us. And so, you know, we got to know Oliver really well, and he rode with us all over the place. And a year, probably like less than a year later, we went out on a tour, and he, he came out, I guess this isn't Warp Tour at that point, but... Um, no, okay, I'll tell the Warp Tour story. Yeah, okay. Uh we we went to this casino in um I want to say it was like Wisconsin or something like that. It was like up somewhere up there. And uh it was Keith Underwood. He was a tattoo artist as well for out of Austin, Texas. Now, he's f- from Chicago actually. Uh But anyway, we're somewhere at this casino. We start rolling. Hard eight, hard eight. And so, like, now we're just searching for casinos everywhere. We go on Warp Tour. Of course, we're in Vegas. Of course, we're gambling. Hard eight, hard eight, hard eight. And so I just get so into gambling with these guys that we're, we're just, like, tattooing hard eight on each other. Like, I, you know, I'm tattooing on him. He's tattooing it on me. Right there. That, that's an Oliver Peck tattoo. Hard eight, and and uh, our boy Nate Woods, um, he kind of took a turn for the worse, but uh, you know he at the time he was a homie and and he was a tattooer as well, so he came out and he was doing it up. We just went crazy, but that was that was you know getting tour tats and and throwing hard eights and making tons of money on and on gambling and not tons of money, a couple hundred dollars here and there. But uh, that leads me to the next tour. He came back out with us and tattooed my whole back. In like he did the f- the full outline, uh, I think he did the full outline in two and a half hours, basically, uh, in the dressing room at the 9:30 club in Washington D.C. So that was a tour where I was just like, Ugh. you know, like for a couple of days, I was like playing, but I had this huge back tattoo trying to heal. Um, but but I finished that whole back tattoo on that tour I want to say no yeah is that possible I definitely had more sittings I had more sittings later on like a week later 
Um, and then I, I think total it was like nine sittings. Um, but I, the last sitting was in the, in the parking lot of the Agora Theater in Cleveland, Ohio. And he, um, Oliver brought his RV along the tour and was just tattooing me and tattooing everybody else and just making money on anybody that wanted tattoos. Um, but that was insane. So we were in Atlantic City on that tour. And again, of course, we're in the casinos. Boom, boom, boom. Heartache for the win. Making all this money. I think I made like, I don't know, 500 bucks. Um, but Oliver made thousands. He made like a couple thousand or something. He was betting more money. Um, but anytime we were throwing, anytime we were betting hard eights, we were all betting together. But um, I remember, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we came back to the bus that night. And that was the night that uh, Tommy Rat had procured a working class lady for our bus driver. So uh, that was interesting. To w to walk in on, but um, uh, we didn't walk in on the actual act, by the way. But we, you know, they were in the back. But uh, you know, think th I'm not gonna go further into it. But <laughs> shenanigans, right? Shug's shenanigans. Um, but that's what Atlantic City, the tumble down song, Atlantic City, is about. That night in in Atlantic City, Atlantic City, where you tonight? The coast is clear, but I don't feel quite right. Um, of course, the the it's not a literal song about what we did throughout the night but the song was definitely inspired by the craziness of that night and i wrote i started writing the lyrics to that song literally that night i think i think i started writing that that night when we were like on the bus i pull out my guitar drunk whatever so yeah all right let's do i don't know one or two more Hi, Mike. This is Mita calling from California. I'm a longtime MXPX fan. I grew up in Chicago, so I saw you all at the Metro in 2000 when I was only 17. So I guess my question is around aging and musical taste. Okay, so as a background, I had a younger coworker, at least 10 years younger than me, ask me to listen to what he says is like an up-and-coming band that he thought I would like called Sleep Token. And I listened, and I was just like meh about the whole thing, like kind of meh, whatever. So it prompted the conversation that do you think as you age, you become like your parents and say, I don't understand what the kids listen to or like these days? Or is it just information overload for our generations who grew up in the 90s and, like, there was no YouTube or Instagram? So, like, you really have to, like, work hard to find a band you like by, like, your friend's friend or going to a show, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm of the party that it's the latter, that it's just information overload, but mostly I just don't want to admit I'm turning into my parents. All right. Thanks, Mike. Keep up the good work. Bye. Yeah. You know, it's hard to say, Mia. Thanks for calling in. That's a great question because we all struggle with that. You know, it's funny because my wife puts on, um, Alexa during the, sorry, I hope you, you guys didn't think didn't turn on. Play MXPX, MXPX. <laughs> uh, but uh, play MXPX by MXP. I don't know how you say it, but um, she'll put on sh pop punk classic or something like that, like oldies. Like, <laughs> and it's 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 our era, like MXPX era punk songs. It's like it's Green Day, it's Blink One Eighty Two, it's MXPX, it's it's uh, Good Charlotte yellow card you know it's that in and, and, and it's like you know some newer emo -y kind of stuff creeps in there or whatever but like there really is like a bunch of songs that we all know from that era you know um 90s punk i guess you could say right 90s punk i would say our 2000s was pretty good too um i would say our you know late late 2000 teens was pretty good but um to answer your question my opinion is when it's a good song it's a good song most of the stuff today sucks yes but most of the, t the stuff in the past sucked too there was a lot of really bad bands like uh, but at the same time like somebody likes ugly kid joe right like somebody loves U ugly kid joe um somebody loves puddle of mud somebody loves you know like I don't knock people for loving what they love. They love it for some reason, and that's cool. 
and the, and the same for MXPX, you know, like you love us for some reason, you know, I'm not saying you love us. So not everybody that listens to the podcast maybe loves MXPX, but most, most listeners probably a little bit. Um, <laughs> I'm going to assume here, uh, at least, okay. How about, let's say most callers. There you go. So info overload, that's a good way to put it because I think, I think it depends on when you hear the song. If you're already like, you've been hearing a bunch of shit all day, you're just like over it. You don't want to hear new music at the end of a day. When you're fresh, you might be open to it. You might be, you know, like ready to hear some new music. But to me, it really is about the song because I hear new songs that I love. I'm like, that is such a good song. Playing it over and over and over. I would say Love Breakers have some songs like that. Um, their new song, Spark. Believe me, you listen to that thing a couple times, you'll be like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a decent song. It's super chill, kind of like. It's like, da na da na da na da na But like, after listening to it a few times, it's in my head now. Like, I was listening to like the, the six song thing we were talking about on the podcast last week. If you haven't heard the podcast, well, you, I don't know why didn't you listen to the podcast last week. So, um, it's... It just gets in your head, man. It's such a good song. So that's a new song. That's in my head. That's a great song. That's a rock and roll song. But there's songs that are pop songs. There's there's um, there's songs that are R&B, songs that are hip-hop, rap songs that are really good. Just really good. Um, punk songs that are really good. And I try to stay open to it. I try to go, is this a good song? Oh, yeah, there's something, something about this, you know, and you can usually, I don't know, there's a feeling about it, right? There's a feeling about it, and and if you don't feel it, then it's not right for you, and it's not good to you, and there's nothing wrong with not liking something. You can, you know, you know what I don't, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say it, you know what I feel like is annoying and wrong is people that don't like something but then have to tell people about it. They have to tell people they don't like it. They have to go online and tell the band or go online and tell their friends. And it's like, you know what? Other people like it. So, like, that's just causing more chaos and friction, more divide, um, negativity, honestly. That's what I'm talking about. People, people like, for instance, we have a beer coming out. And it's come. It's it's out. Actually, I guess it, it just came out this week. This week is the week that it comes out, and it's more of a local thing. I don't know why they they chose not to do uh, mail order. Probably some has something to do with the companies or whatever. But um, we're doing this local beer, and it's it's available in all the stores in Washington State. It's called MXPX All Night IPA. And it's definitely a collector's item. You're going to want to get some if you're a fan. And if you're up in the Pacific Northwest, pick up a case or, or you know, just pick up a few. And if you're one of those people that, uh, lo you know, love to help out fellow fans, pick up an extra case and ship them to a few people that are going to want to buy them off of you. That kind of stuff. That's how we do it in this day and age. We've got to kind of get, get this gorilla mail order thing happening. Don't tell them it's beer. Just pack it really well. Um, because, you know, businesses change and, and the way businesses make money change. And I think that's part of what's happened. Um, but uh, I'm excited about the beer. But wh why I mentioned it was like, there's people that are negative online. They're like, oh, I, I wish I could get this beer, but I bet I can't in Canada or something like that. And it's just like, how do I expect to get a Molson Ice? In, you know, in Bremerton or in Waco? Like, no. Like, come on, dude. Like, beer is not something that is in our control to be able to send it everywhere because of the state laws and the federal laws. You can't send beer over state lines. And they've really, really cracked down on that again since COVID's ended. They've changed those laws back to being more stringent. So, anyway, stoked to have the beer. Sorry if you can't get some, but if you're in Washington, take full advantage if you're in idaho if you're in oregon um if you're in northern california drive up find some um but it's basically going to be around till supplies last you know and you know at a few shows that kind of thing and and uh i'm excited because it's it's uh, another great tasting ipa although i gotta say it's our lightest ipa it's got it doesn't have as much i don't know what do you call it 
stank to it you know it's not the ipa like stankiness um but it but it's you know it's funny because they're like well ipas really just sell much better than a pale ale but really it's a pale ale it's a pale ale with an ipa label um because i love pale ales pale ales are my favorite types of beer because i like a nice crisp like a golden ale something like that i like a golden ale something that's crisp but i like it with a bite and usually a pale ale has a little bit more flavor to it. A little, I don't like it when it gets too sweet or too dank. But uh, beer. Gotta love beer. Um, let's get to one more. One, one more question. And uh, we'll wrap her up. It's a long one. All right, it's uh, Josh from Cincinnati again. Just wanted to do a quick funny story and a question. Uh, I just heard that guy asking about John Snodgrass, and it just reminded me this would have been, God, 10 years ago. I was hanging out with Lou Moves You over in Indianapolis, and Drag the River was playing with him. And we were eating some pizza, and I'm sorry, my car's beeping at me. I just keep my hands off the um, So anyway, we're eating pizza, and John Snodgrass walks up, and Lou introduced us, and just to be funny, I said, oh, I know you, you did vocals on that Tumble Down album, never mentioned Drag the River, I think he was, what, in Armchair Margin, Margin 2 or something, yep. so I just thought it was hilarious, and he just kind of was like, yeah, that, that's me, uh, I don't know, <laughs> funny to me, I guess, had to be there. Uh, quick question, uh, John Moreland, you played with him in Tulsa. I think it was, no, Oklahoma City. You mentioned, or he mentioned, that you had recorded a song together. Did that song ever see the light of day? Um, I was the dude who had just gotten out for the first time since this kid had been born with my wife, and, oh, what's his name? Uh, Stefan from The Descendants was there. So anyway, yeah, yeah um I was just wondering that night when he mentioned that, if you guys ever released that, I'm rambling. I'm driving home from work. It's like 3.20 in the morning. Uh, have a good one. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for calling in, Josh. Um, John Snodgrass is still a great friend of mine um, and a great dude, man. He's awesome. And, yeah, Drag the River is so good. If you get your hands on any of those albums, Drag the River is awesome. Um, Armchair Martian, great. I'm not as familiar with the songs, but I've heard them. They're great. Um, he does solo stuff now, tours a lot. If you check him out, he's awesome. Amazing voice. Um, he's a great storyteller, too. Anyway, John Moreland. Yeah, Oklahoma City, Tulsa. We did play in Tulsa, too, but you probably saw us in, maybe not on that tour. I don't know. Um, Tumbledown stayed with Stefan Edgerton from, you know, Descendants or whatever. He, he was a friend of mine. He was like, he was MXPX's base tech. He was my base tech for a while as well. <laughs> Although he was, he was Stefan Edgerton first from Descendants and, and all that, you know, like, but he, when they weren't doing as much, he came and toured with us and uh, helped us out. Um, anyway, we stayed at his house. Tumbledown stayed at his house um, when we were in Tulsa. And then we went, we went out to, to, uh, to Oklahoma City as well. We play. We played at the uh, Cosmo. Cosmo. It was like something about planets or galaxy or Cosmo or something like that. Like a planetary room or something. Anyway, we played at this place. It was kind of cool. Um, but John Moreland is such a powerhouse. He's such a amazing songwriter and blows me away. But I don't remember what we what what it is you're talking about um i think if i had to guess he probably did something with tumble down and it might have been just at stefan's studio and we probably didn't finish the recording and so it never we never did anything with it but i'll ask stefan if 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 he remembers if we did anything because i'm having trouble I'm, i've been to his you know we, i've recorded at a studio a few different times mxpx actually went there and recorded a cover of like, I think we recorded um, Surrender, Cheap Trick, Surrender. We recorded uh, 
just like a live version of a cover. Um, I think it was before we had recorded the, the on the cover stuff. But anyway, uh, the on the cover two. Sorry. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I just it, it's crazy how these questions come up. And it just jogs all these memories that I hadn't even thought about in so long, like a time of life and a, a really specific time of life, you know, a show. And, and I do remember we'd go to, uh, Stefan's studio was downtown Tulsa. And then he lived, you know, not too far away, but didn't he didn't live downtown. He lived kind of in the suburbs. But um, that studio was great. Like we just would tinker around and, and just record stuff and, we, you know, we'd had to have like a day off or something and just stay at his place. Always cool. I remember the first time I ever visited Stefan. It was uh, it was so long ago, but it was um, it was probably like around early two thousand. I would say like probably like ninety nine, two thousand, somewhere in there. And uh, at the time, he lived in in uh, he didn't live in Tulsa. He lived in. Um, Colorado and so it was like I flew into Denver and then went up to to the town I can't remember the name of the town um it's a town I've been to so many t it's where John Snodgrass lives uh Fort Collins Fort Collins Colorado that's what it is I just popped back into my head um did you see my brain trying to like find it and then it found it um so anyway yeah Fort Collins I went went and stayed Stefan with him and his wife and uh crazy just crazy you know I was single I wasn't married or anything at the time and yeah I was dating like I was dating this girl and she was like friends with his wife but be because of me not because of not because of I was I was not dating a friend of hers she she became friends with her after but <laughs> but it wasn't a very long stretch so I didn't last very long <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, but uh, still great friends with Stefan. Um, John Moreland is one of a kind, man. He's so good. But we played with his band at the time and met a bunch of his band dudes, and those guys were all very cool to hang with. So shout out to anybody, if anybody's listening from, from Tulsa or Oklahoma City. Speaking of Oklahoma City, or is it Tulsa? It's not even either one, but John, John, uh, Jonathan White, he's a solo artist from out there in Oklahoma, and he came up and recorded his EP um, up up here and did a great job. Sounds amazing. Uh, he, his EP, he recorded his EP up at, at Monka Trench Studios, Bremerton. So, Jonathan White. Um, so, anyway, Strange uh, Sons of Strangers was the band, uh, but he also does solo stuff now. So, Sons of Strangers was the first thing, and then he does his own solo stuff. But, Great stuff, man. Um, shout out to Trey, Trey Milburn, Trey B. He's uh, my main man, and he is from Oklahoma. He's my Oklahoma. All right, you guys. Um, shout out to Bob McKnight for producing, making this thing tick. Thank you, my friend. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. Call in. The number is 360-830-6660. You know what to do. Leave a message. Um, let me know what you want to talk about. We'll get into it. Um, but I'm really happy with what you guys have been doing so far. Appreciate you guys. Peace out. MXPeaks.com, all right? Mm -hmm.